Ladies and gentlemen, we are here today with Shafrilla's production's biggest video ever, why Megamind is a subversive masterpiece. Uh, for those of you that are blissfully unaware, Megamind 2 recently came out, and it was a travesty, a nightmare, an affront against God. Megamind 2 is probably one of the worst movies ever made in the history of time ever. And not to mention that, it tarnishes the legacy of something incredibly good. I... I love Megamind, the original Megamind. Uh, it is, in my opinion, one of the greatest movies ever made. And uh, today, we're going to jump into it and see why. I never watched Chef Rillis' specific video on this. Uh, I'm very excited to because I love Megamind so much. It's one of the only shows that I feel like every single... It's, it's a movie, right? It's only like an hour and a half long. But Megamind, Metro Man, and Titan all have full-ass character arcs that are all beautiful and complete. Every single one of them subverting your expectations in the best way. So we are going to be jumping into that today brother and i gotta tell you why i think megamind is actually incredible and one of the goats and we'll mourn together that megamind 2 was such a steaming pile of shit Ten thousand likes and i will do chef Rillis's hour-long video shitting all over megamind 2 so uh leave a like bye Funding for Shape Realist is provided by Squarespace. Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. All right. More info at the end of the video. Let's go. If there's one DreamWorks movie that has seen massive belated acclaim over the years to the point where it can easily be considered a cult classic, it's The Road to El Dorado. Ah! <laughs> I did not see that coming. <laughs> Oh, uh, all right. Uh, listen, both. Both are good. Also, Prince of Egypt, I guess. All right, okay, dude. And Over the Hedge. All right, okay. Oh, and, my okay, God. Okay, I guess a lot of DreamWorks movies have that status, but none have been quite as prevalent as of late than Megamind. Dude, Megamind is... It's literally next level. Literally next level. I thought it was good as a kid, but not much else. It didn't stick with me like other DreamWorks films I really liked. And that's kind of how the general public felt. There's no way Megamind has a 72% on Rotten Tomatoes. Megamind Rotten Tomatoes. There's no way. Oh my, I, I cannot believe this. This is, this is embarrassing. This, this is actually embarrassing. I cannot believe that. It came out the same year that DreamWorks concluded their most profitable franchise with a vastly underappreciated Shrek Forever After, and the same year DreamWorks started their most respected franchise, How to Train Your Dragon. This film kind of got lost in the shuffle as a result. How did this get lost? I love this movie! ...result of releasing so close to these two franchise toppers. Well, that's not entirely true. There was also... No! God, please, no! True, despicable me. No! No! Index. Now, I know what you're thinking. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Did Katzenberg have his tiny spy cameras planted on anyone who even thought about releasing an animated movie? But, but that's just a theory. A game theory. Yeah, but the point is, um, I, I do see the overlap between Megamind, who wants to be, like, the greatest villain, and Gru from Despicable Me, who wanted to be the greatest villain. Like, I definitely see the overlap. And I, I love Despicable Me, the first one, okay? I thought it was great. But Megamind, Megamind is like, it's one of the rare shows that I feel like wraps everything up in such a nice, tight little bundle. Like, every single scene ends up becoming just awesome. Uh... Jeffrey Katzenberg could very well be keeping tabs on every single person who has ever dabbled in animation at all, just to steal their ideas okay, for his dying right. animation cool, company cool. that is now being helmed by the head of Illumination. How wonderful. And yeah, the precursor to Illumination's domination and DreamWorks's increasing irrelevance throughout the animation industry can be oh, trade releases and the aftermath that followed. One was this copyrighted? Is that why there's the awkward cuts? You have to co cut out copyrighted content? One was massively successful, spawning a gigantic franchise that is solely responsible for the minion-ridden hellscape that we now toil in. And Honestly, real. But dude, what Megamind did was so different. It didn't, like, it didn't sell out, you know? Like, when it comes to Despicable Me, I feel like the whole minion gimmick for Despicable Me is a bit of a sellout. Like, it, the idea is to sell plushies and stuff. And again, don't get me wrong, I really love the first Despicable Me. But Megamind didn't have a gimmick that was a sellout moment. I, f I feel like there are so many just incredibly iconic moments from Megamind, you know? And that's just because it had what everything else lacked. It had presentation! And the other... 
didn't do that. As a kid, I liked Despicable Me a lot more than Megamind. It just seemed a lot funnier and even more emotional at times. Now, as an adult, whenever I see this movie, I really, really still like it. Keep in mind, this was yeah, back before Illumination figured out that they didn't have to try in order to make a profit on their m oh. Oh, don't remind me how they were like, holy shit, we can just put minions in anything and it'll make crazy money. Movies. So with their first outing, they actually tried with good emotional beats and funny jokes. This is pretty much the only good animated film they've ever made as a result. But of course, now I think it's a darn shame that this was the massive success between these two movies. Because revisiting Megamind as an adult, I can now see the emotional intelligence, wit, and even artistry at work in this Real. underappreciated gem. More Real. I feel like Megamind and um it, it did feel very mature i think i think that's why a lot of kids didn't love megamind like they love despicable me because it wasn't just it wasn't purely goofy like it's a tragic tale right you have a character like megamind who grew up always being picked on he was like the nerdy guy and he felt like the only way he could stand out is to be a super villain so he tried to craft that to kind of be his his thing that was his persona and he sort of hated it because the moment he actually seemingly won and it was over like he had no friends aside from his one little fish guy and he had no future he had no goals he had no aims he was someone that was bullied into thinking something of themselves that they really weren't it's like it's a very emotionally mature movie and it doesn't hit the same beats as you know despicable me which obviously is much goofier and i think just superficially funnier but you know more and more people are really starting to connect with this one and recognize its strengths so i figured i'd take a look at it and see what those strengths are All right. here's why megamind is a subversive masterpiece it really is nature versus nurture honestly this i think is it's a, a discussion as old as time uh, and i think it very much fits the bill to be one of the major talking points for megamind right he was nurtured like he grew up as the villain even though in his heart he's like a really he's a good guy one of megamind's strongest attributes is the shockingly mature story it decides to tell with its characters this movie has a lot every single one of these characters like is such a good character like in its own right right yeah even titan i think he's one of the best villains ever made in an animated movie even though he is a complete goofball a lot of introspection and reflection and connection and okay. misdirection right, and inspection okay, and direction guys. bottom line i'm true real based and is the way events unfold in this movie are kind of novel for an animated comedy made for kids this is another one of those kids movies that very rarely talks down to its audience if at all so just like Superman, Megamind is a baby on a planet that's yeah. gonna blow up. He gets escape they potted away, away, but it turns at the same time turns out that this other kid had the exact same idea Me which is hilarious right it's obviously goofing on the superman trope Metro man ends up with a loving family that seems to have a ton of riches and notoriety per and i think another gimmick that i really liked is while megamind's spacecraft was flying it almost landed into this loving family's house but Metro Man spacecraft knocked Megamind's out and Megamind ended up falling somewhere else and then he ended up falling into the loving family's arms like which is really funny perfect for raising the ego of a young impressionable mind but Megamind goes to prison he just lands in prison and they and they raise him there for some reason they just keep him there can we keep it <laughs> That's just great, honestly. It's funny as shit, okay? That's a funny, stupid gimmick. I feel like right off the bat, this movie contains undertones of the whole nature versus nurture debate, of which I am an expert because I wrote a paper on it in the 10th grade. Let's I got like go. a B, I think. Huge. So yeah, like I said, expert. I know everything there is to know yeah. about it. The debate essentially boils down to the question, is bad behavior inherited or acquired? In this case, we don't really know anything about the traits that Mega Man or Metro Mind inherited from their families or home planets. For all we know, Metro Man could have come from a planet of evil space tyrants. True, maybe he was a Viltramite, who knows? But not the point, because he was brought up by this wholesome family, and he became a hero. And Megamind was brought up by these evil fuckers in jail, and he became a villain. Kinda like Superman. And Megamind could be from a world of benevolent blue people, like that live-action Pocahontas remake James Cameron made. I personally yeah. think that Megamind was not destined for evil, nor did he come from some sort of evil planet. This line has always been especially clever to me. You are destined for- I didn't quite hear that last part, but it sounded important. 
right? Because it doesn't matter what you're destined for. Destined what? for what? Not only is that pretty funny, but it allows us to fill in the blank ourselves. Is Megamind destined for greatness? Heroism? Destruction? Decay? What? Well, that's up for him to decide. He's destined to be made fun of for his sequel movie, which was an absolute joke and abomination. Or, I guess, for society to decide. This is where the nurture element comes into play, and where the two sides start conflicting. Megamind is raised to think that burglars good. Burglars based. Criminals based. Police bad. Oh. Which, you know, that last thing is kind of true sometimes, but let's not worry about hey, that. Hey, Megamind. Hey, whoa, whoa. <laughs> we, we not going there. He's been nurtured to be bad and yeah. use his intellect to escape prison. Born to be bad. But his nature suggests otherwise. He's excited to go to school and fit in among his peers. He wants to impress them and be loved. But constantly being rejected because of his dangerous failed inventions and because people be racist towards blue guys, I guess. Listen, he's blue. Makes him doubt himself and turn back to the things he's been taught. He and the things he was good at, right? He gives in to how he was nurtured, despite his nature being good at heart. Yeah, which I think is just really great writing. Later on in the movie, he slowly starts getting reformed through the positive influence in his life that is Roxanne. But once she discovers his true identity and rejects him, his immediate impulse is to go back to the villainy that defined his life for so long. He's convinced himself that being bad is simply in his nature, when that I, couldn't I be further from the truth. I absolutely positively love that that is the, the character development for this guy. Now, he ended up falling in love with Roxy through whatever, and he tricked her into thinking he was someone else. And then when he finally reveals himself, and, you know, inadvertently also proving that he's been lying to her their whole relationship, she gets obviously upset and ditches him, which is the obvious thing to do. He lied to her. His Their entire relationship was fabricated on lies, but he took that to be the racism and the, the way society was crushing him down his entire childhood and... You know, in order to feel like he he's just evil. He should just embrace just being evil. Like, I really love that that that's such a small little moment. God, it's so good. It's so sharp and on point. Like, he feels like, oh, it's because of racism. But no, it's because he was a shitty person. You know? And it'll just push him and radicalize him further down that rabbit hole, believing that this is the extent of who he could be. Truth. Everyone in Metro City thinks that, however. Everyone reinforces this idea through their hatred and rejection of him. It's no surprise. Now they hate him because he's blowing shit up. Surprised that he internalizes that idea for so long. But it's not just negative reinforcement that can warp the way a person perceives their role in the world. Let's talk about the quote unquote good guy. Yeah. The way Met I love Metro Man. What a character! Metro Man is developed throughout the course of the story is also really interesting. In a story about a sympathetic villain who always loses to a beloved hero, the movie would usually end up making that hero the- The incredibly pompous bad guy. They would make him the egotistical Markiplier bad guy. Movie's antagonist. Not necessarily evil, since that'd be weird. That was his mistake! But- well, Yeah, right, that's a lot of people's mistakes. Everyone likes taking the, the superhero trope and just making him a bad guy. And, and he became all egotistical, and, and he became rich, and he became corrupt, and, and no, Metro Man didn't. You know, a big asshole, a meanie head. This movie doesn't go that direction, however. Metro Man is kind to citizens while simultaneously coming off as very egotistical and self-absorbed. It's clear from his smug looks. As What's hilarious about Metro Man is he doesn't fake it like every hero. You know how every hero, like they, they need to do the Homelander shit where they smile at the public and behind the scenes they're evil? He is exactly who he is behind the scenes and in public. He's not duplicitous in any way. He's a kid that he adores the attention and he kind of lets it go to his head. The ceremony celebrating him at the beginning of the movie is one of the best character establishment scenes I've ever seen. It's so good. I thank you, random citizen. Animated film. He's modeled after Elvis Presley and he clearly- God, he's, he's hilarious. He has some rock star flair, but the way he uses his superpowers is kind of questionable. Like when he juggles babies, it can't- Yeah, he's, he's not- <laughs> And it gives off the impression that these are just props to him, and he's so overconfident in his abilities that he has no problem with tossing babies up into the air and flinging them back to their parents at high speed. 
Like, what a great way to show off this guy's arrogance and conceited nature. And I love how the mothers aren't even concerned because of how- Because it's Metro Man. Of course you gotta believe him. How much everyone worships him. Speak superhero Markiplier. I trust him. Speaking of which- So he can do a couple of tricks. Not like he can walk on water. Hey, everybody! This is just a fantastic way to establish hubris that I can- Right, right, like doing literally the Jesus poses and not get over it. And then there's this iconic line. I love you, Metro Man. And I, I love you, random citizen. I love you, random citizen. See, he doesn't really care about this guy to simply say, and I love you, sir, or, and I love you. These are just random citizens to him. People who give him adoration and praise, even though he really doesn't care about saving them. And this becomes obvious when he fakes his own death and lets Megamind and later Titan take over the city without doing anything because he's- God. I love this character development so much. Tired of being a hero and wants to play music. And Music Man was born. Music Man? That way I could keep my logo. Cause of what? Again? He really only cares about- Right, cause his logo's an M for Metro Man, we get Music Man. Yeah, no notoriety, huh? No, but so here's my uh, my hot take. Now this is a very, very hot take that could be completely wrong, but it's awesome at the same time. Metro Man grew up his whole life never actually having to work on anything he was always the best at everything and yes while he loved the ego and all that he was living an incredibly boring life he wanted to improve and he could never actually improve at all okay this is i was thinking of doing character analyses and all the characters in mega man and, Me and mega mind so i was like thinking about this he he finally becomes music man right he retires he runs away he goes to a place to live out his El elvis presley dreams He's playing music, and he's shit. He's bad at music. He's so bad at it. But that's perfect. He's finally bad at something. He could finally struggle to get better at something. He could look forward to improving. That's why him becoming music, man, was so important. Because his entire life was given to him on a silver platter where nothing meant anything because he was just so perfect at everything. Like... This guy is an iconic character. He He's so, so iconic. And honestly, he lives up to his perfect character development throughout. He knew that Megamind isn't a bad, bad guy. He's just doing all this villainous shit because it's the thing to do. He, to some extent, was able to rely on Megamind. You know, if anything really bad happened. Well... Yes and no. It becomes evident that Metro Man never aspired to be a superhero and- No, he was born into the role and he was forced there, right? Like he's some guy, he's a random kid on Earth, superpowers, everyone looks up to him, he's good at everything. You can kind of understand him when he says he was never really given a choice and always had to be what the city wanted. It's understandable that he couldn't handle the societal pressure to be one thing forever, but at the same time, it signifies that they he's- They actually made him an iconic character. Metro Man, like, wow. Not really deserving of the title of superhero. Remember like, how did they, isn't it insane how they literally thought of a full character plotline for every single character in this movie? Remember in Spider-Verse when MJ said, Peter didn't ask for his powers, but he chose to be Spider-Man. Peter is naturally good at heart, and he used his powers to help others and make a difference, which is what made him a superhero. Metro Man really only ever cared about the notoriety that came from stopping Megamind, be it gold stars in class or a museum dedicated to him. Society molded him into an egotist, but it never really gave him a choice in the matter. So when he chooses True. not to be Metro Man anymore and fake his own death, is he being selfish, or is it good that he's putting his own feelings before that of society? That's a good question, and honestly, it is it is selfish, but at the same time, he was never able to really be him. As the only superhero the city has ever known, does he owe them more than, say, a fireman who gets tired of firefighting and just kinda leaves one day? Or is there a sense of truth present when he tells Megamind, There's a yin for every yang. If there's bad, good will rise up against it. It's taken me a long time to find my calling. Now it's about time you find yours. Ah! The movie doesn't really pick a side either way about whether or not- I, I love that so much. It's like, you're right. He is not being selfless here. He's not being the hero here. 
But is it always his obligation to always be on top of everything? Metro Man's choice is justified or cowardly. It's up to the audience to decide, and I really like that. He doesn't have that moment where he comes back in the end, it's just Mega Mind pretending to be him in order to scare off Titan. That's honestly a great subversion of that tired, annoying trope that even Moana does. Honestly, that's probably the only problem I have with Moana, if we're being honest. Instead of Maui coming back for no reason to help Moana fight Daka, Tamatoa should have risen from the depths and entered a kaiju battle, oh which would have gone down as the greatest Stop. third act in cinematic history, but whatever, they tried, I guess. Alright, whatever, okay, dude. But if Metro Man using his powers for notoriety casts him in a negative light, what about someone using those powers for oh. evil? Yes, sir, the Titan. Evil! Evil! Hal is an incel. Bro, Hal, Titan, one of the greatest twist villains of all time. <laughs> Hal Stewart is an incel, and also one of the most unique and subversive takes on a supervillain I've ever seen. Oh, 100%. A supervillain that was created by the main character to be a hero, but he ended up becoming a villain because absolute power really does corrupt absolutely. Remember in my Frollo video when I said that Disney would never have the guts to develop a seemingly nice character into a villain over the course of a story unless they were secretly evil the whole time? That was his stick! Well, what do you know? DreamWorks already beat him to it. Hal doesn't start off as an evil monster, though he also isn't exactly- He's just weird, awkward, and a little selfish. Really a nice guy. Unless no. we're talking this kind. Yeah, he's, he's the Discord mod. If he mentioned a nicer guy, he is a nice guy. He's kind of a total creep, actually, who feels entitled to Roxanne because he's just so gosh darn nice to her. He's not like those other guys. You yeah. see, he's a nerd, so there's no way in hell that he could mistreat her. He understands women. He gets it. Honestly, Bro. this character was kind of ahead of his time since we now live in the age of nice it's guys. It's crazy. This it's literally the Discord mod uh, personified. But what's so funny is, like, he's someone with no power, right? And he feels like he's entitled to everything because he's so nice. But And if he had power, he would, he would use it the right way. But then he gets power, and he gets corrupted. This bizarre sense of entitlement to women, because media and society have made them believe that they deserve the girl, no matter what. Only now is this sort of skeevy behavior starting to get called out, but Mega Man got it even back in 2010. If an entitled perv suddenly got godlike powers in real life... Yeah, this is what would happen. It would corrupt the shit out of him. They would be the villain. He gets angry when Roxanne hangs out with another guy. He has a poster of her hanging up with a taped on portion that says, Good night. How he invites her to a party where it's just gonna be the two of them with a wedding photographer there? I don't know how. I don't really feel like being around a bunch of people. No, no, no. That's the best part. It'll just be like you and me. What? In how? <laughs> it's fucking weird. Find the only thing holding him back from being with Roxanne is a lack of superpowers. Right? That's what he thinks. Cause that's what everyone thinks. People think that, well, if only I had this, if only I had that X factor, if only I was a foot taller, if only I had a million dollars, if only etc, etc, etc. Don't actually work on fixing yourself, just wishing that you were in the shoes that, of somebody else. If only you had all those things, all of your problems would be solved. Well... He's already perfect for her, but she likes Metro Man because he's got muscles and perfect hair and so on and so forth. So now that Hal's super, all he has to do is take her on a flight against her will, put her in mortal danger, then save her. Ta-da! They're in love! Except no, because that's unrealistic and dumb. Roxanne justifiably tells him that they'll never be together, and he kinda throws a temper tantrum and leaves. He's unable to accept the idea that the problem wasn't his lack of powers, it was his scumminess and entitlement. Much like how Metro Man- Or, you know, him just being a shitty guy. Like, in general. Like, it's... <sighs> but it's so funny how everyone will always, instead of actually doing some introspection and looking into who they are themselves, maybe wondering if perhaps they are the problem it's so much easier to always blame it on the not having the ability to do other things you didn't have a uh you're not super smart you're not super hot you're not super tall you're not super ripped you're not super rich right like it's so much easier to blame it on other things and say well that can't be fixed if only the world was fair man stuck with the hero gig in order to but get in actuality you ain't entitled to nothing brother in adoration, Hal only wanted to be a hero in order to get the girl. When that doesn't happen, he decides to steal stuff instead because it's just in his nature to be horrible. Now he finally has an- Oh, 
his nature was always just being entitled to shit and blaming other things as to why he wasn't getting it. You live life like that long enough and you feel like there's not going to actually be consequences to any of the actions you take and you're entitled and you could do all that shit. Well, yeah. Outlet to do horrible stuff without any concern of potential consequences. And also, I didn't pick up on this until the end of this whole script writing process, but I now kind of see some similarities with Syndrome. A dorky yeah, ginger kid I gets rejected, it. which makes him angry, but then he gets super abilities of some kind and now he's out for a revenge. Hal is admittedly no Syndrome in terms of menace or- Yeah, I feel like they're- the major difference between these is uh, Syndrome somehow turned it into a philosophy thing, whereas Titan just became mega corrupted. Well... PRESENTATION! Ah, uh, dude, I love Megamind. Every line is a meme. He's probably funnier than Syndrome, so there's that. You're living a fantasy. There, there is, is no, no Easter, Easter Bunny, Bunny, there is no Tooth Fairy, and, and there is no Queen of England. England. No, that's... <laughs> Not Plus, Syndrome was a commentary on Toxic Entitled Fans. You're not affiliated with me! Hal is a commentary on Toxic Entitled Nerds who think they're owed women's affection. Yeah, he calls Roxanne out for never taking the time to get to know him before he became Titan. But then you remember that he is- But then you remember that she has no obligation to get to know him! Bro! The crazy thing is- I, I love how when you watch this show and you like you see Hal and you're like, wow, she really didn't take the time to get to know him. And then you're like, wait a second. She literally does not have to get to know this guy. Stop feeling so entitled. Literally never not been creepy in any of the scenes these two characters shared. I genuinely hope nobody watched this movie and said, yeah, well, Hal has a point, no, you know, no. because like... No. Hey, wait a minute. How did he even afford a wedding photographer in a bouncy castle with the salary of a cameraman? Hey, wait, he lives in this tiny apartment. Where was the bouncy castle supposed to go up? Unless he was <gasps> lying about it? You really think someone would do that? that Lie on the internet. That's it. I hate this guy even more now. He's even Damn. eviler than Syndrome and the most evilest bad guy wow. in the whole world. How could he betray the sanctity of bouncy castles like that? I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. Can we just cut to the next part? Humor and music, it is funny. Ah, the trademark Schaeferless talks about humor and music in the same segment segment of the video. Ah, presentation! It's kind of hard to talk about what makes comedy work or not work due to its subjective nature. And I think the biggest flaw with my Shrek 2 video is my inability to fully explain what made the comedy work so well. So let me try to thoroughly detail why Megamind is a cinematic riot. This movie just has all a right, sense of- Alright, alright, I'm ready. I never really looked at it from that perspective, but let's go. I'm here. I'm here energy dude i really want to get more into uh i hope he gets more into the nitty gritty of what makes megamind such a good character like the back and forth there like god to it that a lot of other animated movies sorely lack it's not overly energetic like that wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube man from norm of the north but it's not lifeless and flat like the entirety of shrek the third there's always a great sense of comedic pacing which is owed to the performances the animation the editing and the writing all coming together into a great package will ferrell is great as megamind honest so good so good just him locking the car door after it's ripped off the car has me laughing every single time Honestly, this might be his best role. He delivers his comedic lines so expressively and delightfully while also bringing a nice amount of dramatic pathos to the role. Tina Fey, Brad Pitt, and David Cross all bring a lot to their characters as well. And while Jonah Hill is pretty well cast as Hal and delivers some lines very well, there are admittedly some lines that could have used an extra take or two and didn't feel super convincing. This isn't how you play the game. Game over. Wait, that was the best take you got from him? Still, for the most part, this movie All doesn't right, feel okay. like celebrities going through the motions. It feels like a genuinely great cast that complements the roles and the script. It's not like those random animated movies that just throw <laughs> Seth Rogen in there because haha, -ha, funny man voice- I agree, I completely agree. You throw Seth Rogen in everything now. It's animal, haha, -ha, funny joke. Even Kung Fu Panda is guilty of this. Just, can Hollywood stop hiring Seth Rogen for voiceover work? I don't even hate him. I'm just tired of hearing his voice. Oy vey. Let's get back to talking about funny movies. Wow! We know. The animation lends itself to comedy so well simply based on the way the characters move. There's a hilarious segment where Megamind- And I also love how Megamind, like, his- his worldview is so warped, right? Warped by the fact that he feels like the whole world is out to get him because that was the pre-designed role for him. He was destined for this spot. He was born and raised in a prison. He was hated by everyone. He was constantly arrested. He immediately got himself some sort of arch nemesis in Metro Man. Like, the fact that this guy, he grew up his whole life with that perspective. He finally accomplishes his goal, seemingly, and that's not the case. 
right? He ends up feeling double betrayed, betrayed that there was nothing, no purpose to anything, betrayed that he didn't actually defeat Metro Man and Metro Man just used him as, a, as an excuse to retire. Like, the fact that this man's entire world collapsed around him. So his first, his first opportunity he took was to turn Titan into a villain, right? So, or, or into a hero, rather, so that he can be that villain again. He can continue living in that world that he loves. And then he had to completely destroy that yet again and rebuild himself as someone that he was proud of, right? Like, it's such a beautifully ironic storytelling, you know? Like, and the reason why I mentioned that here in his comedy section is because it makes all the scenes so funny. Well, there's nothing funnier than the just complete subversion of this guy who you're watching and you know is a good person inside just doing the most heinous, awful shit all the time and just like laughing about it like it's funny and goofy. Mind pretends to fight another guy who he's disguising himself as, so he switches back and forth while also complimenting himself along the way. It's so good. There's also the way his giant robot moves, the poses and body language Metro Man and Titan make while flying, all the amazing facial expressions these characters make. It well, say goodbye to literally all of that in Megamind 2, which looks like a fucking cereal box. It's so solid. But obviously the star of the show here is the writing. It feels like this movie has more laughs per minute than the average DreamWorks movie. It simply crams so many into a short period of time that even if one isn't a banger, there are at least five more coming up that are. Dude, that exchange between- Right, dude, just Metro Man walking into the room. Even if one isn't a banger, oh there are at least- Oh my god, this scene right here- Five more just... coming up that are. <laughs> <laughs> They're in his house? Dude, that exchange between Megamind and Metro Man about warranties, that actually made me laugh harder than anything in Shrek 2. That is high praise right there. These characters just Damn. have such strong, quirky personalities that mesh really well together and lead to a ton of great exchanges over the course of the movie. The other thing that meshes well? The music. There's so many iconic rock songs that complement the bad theme so well. Like Back in Black, Crazy Train, Welcome to the Jungle, Bad. Dude, the Welcome to the Jungle, that scene was so good. And of course, Highway to Hell. The Fitness Gram Pacer Fitness Test is a multi stage aerobic what capacity the? test. Okay. William, that you're sitting on the remote. Huh? As it continues. Oh, sorry. I thought it was a brownie. Anyway, yeah, these songs are well implemented and make these scenes exciting. Nothing amazing in this department, but it's important to recognize that it doesn't have the same Garbo implementation as Shrek the Third. That's important. Oh yeah, and hearing Mr. Blue Sky play over a montage that includes a Donkey Kong reference. Dude, the Donkey Kong gimmick, like, there's up. so much style in this movie. Look at this scene and tell me it's not just oozing personality. I, I never knew I needed. So yeah, great characters, humor, music, animation, all that good stuff. But how's the... <laughs> but the plot. Oh, fuck. How about I serve you a delicious plate of drama? Better eat it hot, because it does not taste good when we heat it in the microwave of evil. Let me tell you. Who would I be without you? I love you, Metro Man! And I love you, random citizen! <laughs> <laughs> Romance and bettering yourself. Dude, because that's what it's about, man. It's kind of weird that I went this long without discussing the actual story. <laughs> I love this guy. I love when Mega Man did Mega but Man But to be honest, I just wanted to save the best part of the movie for last. Yeah. Though, don't expect this to have the same impact as the end of the Shrek 2 review. I'm just going to say right off the bat that I don't even plan on trying to top that. I don't have the same personal connection to Mega Man's growth in this movie as I did with Shrek's. But I think the character growth this movie showcases is almost as strong, if not equal, to Shrek 2. Towards the beginning, I mentioned that Megamind is really only a villain because society deems him so. No one has ever given him a chance to be anything other than evil. Yeah, it's no one's ever looked at him as anything other than evil. It's the only thing he's good at because it's the only thing he's allowed to do. So when he takes over the city, it's no surprise that he quickly becomes bored of it. The superhero he fought, the only person who gave his life any sort of meaning, gone. is now gone. He has no purpose anymore. Yeah, that's what I was mentioning earlier. It's crazy how, how this man changes, and he feels like he to find purpose, he has to reinvent the situation that had him locked up all along. No bitches. That's the thing about life. Success is actually kind of meaningless in the sense that it doesn't give you true happiness. True happiness comes from connecting with others, forming bonds, and, you know, understanding yourself sharing experiences, and making each other happy. This isn't strictly tied to romantic connection, it's just in our nature to seek companionship of any kind. That's all Megamind wanted growing up, 
to be loved and accepted by his peers. But just like Shrek, he's an outcast simply due to society's preconceived notions about him and his nature, meaning he has no choice but to be the monster that yeah. people expect him to be. Now that his evil ambitions so have been sad. achieved, of course he's unhappy. He never aspired to be evil until society convinced him that's what he wanted. It well, and, and that's the only way he felt like he had a connection with people. If he would have been a good guy, he would have been ignored by Metro Man and hated by the world. At least this way, he sort of felt like there was something, some purpose. To be honest, what's worse? To be hated or to be ignored, right? It's almost poetic that he finally finds genuine purpose with Roxanne Ritchie. Yes, he kidnapped her a bunch of times, but that's the villain gig. Kidnapping someone close to Metro Man to draw him out. Right? Not that- nothing personal! See, even Roxanne doesn't- isn't really afraid of him. It's clearly not personal against her, as evidenced by this exchange. What if tomorrow we could go kidnap Roxanne Ritchie? That always seems to lift your spirit. Right? And he's like, ah! Like he- <laughs> Good idea, Minion. But without him, what's the point? Right? Like, it was never about actually kidnapping Roxanne, right? It was never a- See, w w Bowser kidnaps Peach for Peach. He just did it because that was the game. So when he accidentally inspires her while disguised as the librarian Bernard, and she returns that kindness by being kind to him for the first time, you get the feeling that he deserves this second chance at happiness. They both deserve a chance at happiness after all they've been through. And now that there's someone in Megamind's life treating him with genuine affection, other than Minion who's great but really just an enabler for his evil schemes. Yeah, Minion's a yes man. A yes man is never, never ever to be trusted. How can you trust someone that will always agree and always support no matter what you do? You can't. Megamind finally has a chance to grow as a person and improve himself. He cleans up the streets, returns everything he stole, and makes the city a safer place, all to make Roxanne happy. This is what a loving companion can do, help you become the best version of yourself you can be. Really? Yeah, he's technically lying to her, but it's not to hurt her, and there's no way that she would give the villain who murdered a superhero and took over the city a chance. And you know what? She's totally justified in thinking that. 100%. I, I mentioned that earlier also. So when she does finally find out it's Megamind and they have an emotional confrontation where she tells him off for all the horrible things he's done, it's brutally heartbreaking. You know? Because on the one hand, she's 100% right with what she is saying. And on the other hand, I could totally understand why Megamind would be completely shattered by something like this. Like, it's just peak writing on both sides. You no, know she's right, but you also know that he's become such a better person thanks to her. This isn't some forced rift that tears two characters apart before- Yeah, which I absolutely hate it. You know, the, the trope that every single show and movie has the trope where the guy and the girl, they kind of like each other, but there's that one secret and the secret gets revealed and then they hate each other and then they become friends again. Like, it's so gimmicky and quirky and it happens in literally everything. Here, it makes so much sense from both angles. For they reunite in the climax, which admittedly this movie also does, but it's pretty well handled, so that's fine. This is an organic, unflinchingly honest moment that speaks to the emotional complexity and maturity of this animated blue Will Ferrell movie. That was a real sentence, yes. yes! This is DreamWorks' greatest strength as a company. They understand the intricacies of wanting to find meaning in something you never thought you were cut out for. Real, real. Kung Fu Panda is still the best animated movie of all time. Even if you never thought it was possible to be a good person, someone worthy of caring and praise and love, you always have the capacity to be that person. Everyone has it in them to change. And anyone who's been wronged by someone in the past so many times is completely justified in not giving that person another chance. Megamind yeah. understands this. And rather than kidnap Roxanne or force her to be with him because that's not what he was ever about He was never a bad guy, right? God, dude, what a great movie He lets her go because he's grown to respect her as a person and admits and he also he wants her to like him for him He doesn't want to force her into liking him or anything like that that her hatred for him and it's justified It's so justified and he knows that everything he's done is justified. This is great character growth that is deliberately contrasted with Hal, who can't- Because the moment Hal gets power or the ability, he'll- he immediately grabs her. 
he immediately feels entitled to her. He can't move on because he sees Roxanne as an object who owes him affection. When Hal goes berserk, Megamind and Roxanne have no choice but to team up again and find Metro Man, who as it turns out, has no interest in helping them or the city. He tries to encourage Megamind by telling him that good will always rise to match evil, and that it may finally be his time to prove that he's good at heart. And... After all the rejection Megamind has received, after everyone telling him that he'll never be more than a villain, he's internalized it and is unable to move past it. Real. Real. And he turns himself in. Bro, what a scene. But what I love so much about this is it's not just the internalizing it and end up you know, acknowledging that he's a villain and stuff. But it's when he actually does do something heroic, he does it through his villainy, right? He doesn't put on a white cloak and become a, a hero and beacon of light and justice that doesn't say the fuck word or whatever heroes do, right? He doesn't actually take on a hero role. He remains in his same villainous aesthetic when he does heroicness. Because ultimately, you have to embrace who you are. To, you, you don't become something you're not because that is something that society appreciates. You have to hone in on what makes you you, and society will end up appreciating you for you. So he turns himself into jail. I used to find this plot point kind of forced, but honestly, at this point in the story, it makes perfect sense that he doubt himself to this degree. After rec right, because he never wanted to hurt anybody. Reconciling with Minion and realizing that he can at least right the wrongs he caused Roxanne and the city, he returns, but disguised as Metro Man. Right, because that, that's how it starts. It starts off with him disguised as Metro Man, because that's what a hero has to be. This is crucial, not only because it intimidates Hal, but because he wants to give the city something to believe in. The hero they deserve. But also I think it's because he he felt like he could never be regarded as a hero the way he actually is. I feel like that's another major detail. When Minion says, he's the real hero. I felt that, man. But the best part is when he descends after scaring Titan off, with the cheers of an adoring public echoing through the streets, only for Roxanne to extend her hand. Kind of unsure what to do, Megamind grabs her hand. But she goes for the watch and changes him back to normal. Because it was never about the facade, bro much to his and the crowd's surprise. He didn't think these people would understand or accept the idea that he came to save them. He wanted to keep the charade going since he thought it was in everyone's best interest to believe he was someone else. I think it's also because he felt like he couldn't be the one to, uh, to do anything good like that, right? He didn't think he could be a hero for Metrocity. Just like the entire time he was with Roxanne. But she makes the decision to let everyone know that yes, Megamind has changed for the better. And while the crowd hasn't quite figured out how to feel about this, the smile Roxanne gives him is all the acceptance he needs. Ah! Pretty sneaky, sis. But there's only one person I know who calls this town Metrocity. Oh God. All that brain. This is honestly a really clever way for Titan to figure out it wasn't Metro Man. So after a brief fight with some solid laughs and even emotional reconciliations, Megamind finally saves the day, not by pretending to be someone he's not, but through his ingenuity and amazing inventions. The crowd cheers for him. That's it, because that is it. You gotta be you. You gotta be freaking you. And much like a lot of this movie, it's a perfect blend between heartfelt and hilarious. <laughs> Get back, you savages! Sorry. <laughs> I love that scene so much. He's just not used to these people liking him. And he's like, oh, I'm like, fucking shit, I love that scene. One more time. Blend between heartfelt and hilarious. Right, because him and Roxanne, that he's used to already. <laughs> Get back, you savages! Right? He's just so not used to that shit. I love it. Sorry, sorry. He's just not used to positive feedback. And after a great ending sequence where Megamind gets his own ceremony, the movie is over. Wow, what an incredible, funny, emotional, well-written masterpiece. I'm so glad it got the critical and commercial respect it deserved. Not. Yeah, all right, we got <laughs> Epilogue, why critics and audiences were so stupid in 2010. Yeah, honestly, but I love, my favorite part about Megamind is how it ended there and there was no sequel that ever happened ever.
Megamind is the most baffling non-success I've ever seen. I get that Despicable Me came out first and everyone liked it or whatever, but Megamind is just a lot richer, more emotionally mature, and way funnier than Despicable Me. Which I also really like, mind you. Um, if I had to say, I would say Despicable Me is probably funnier in my opinion. I don't know. M maybe. I, I think so. Probably, but I, I do think that you cannot compare the emotional maturity of these movies. However, it made less money, had less positive critical reception, and made much, MUCH less of an impact on popular culture. But it endures in a ton of internet circles, since people are really starting to realize in retrospect that it's one of DreamWorks' best mo Retro Man! movies to date. I don't think it's derivative at all, and I appreciate the subversions and twists it applies to the superhero formula. But people at the time didn't see it that way, including Mr. Mr. Jeffrey Katzenberg. Back in April 2011, in a Ooh. statement that really grinds my gears, Katzenberg said that DreamWorks would not produce any more movie genre parodies like Shark Tale, Monsters vs. Aliens, and Megamind. He called Megamind a parody because it was subverting superhero tropes oh man stating that they quote all shared an approach and tone and idea of parody oh, and did not man. travel well internationally oh man oh, now look, it's one thing to realize that genre parodies as a whole aren't generating revenue and to focus your efforts onto other projects. But this statement, which lumps a smart, emotional, witty, subversive take on a genre with two pieces of garbage that <laughs> Dude, Shark couldn't Tale. be bothered. Okay, Monsters vs. Aliens was, was not like utter trash, right? Like it, it was redeemable, unlike Shark Tale. To tell good stories represents a fundamental misunderstanding of what Megamind was trying to accomplish. Dude, Megamind's so fucking good. The problem with Shark Tale wasn't that it tried to parody mobster. No, the problem with Shark Tale was it was shit. It was trash. The characters were ass. The plot made no sense. Movies. The problem was literally everything else about it. <laughs> literally it is a everything. It is a fundamental disaster at every possible turn. Fundamentally broken movie. The mobster stuff. I don't know why we both said fundamental. That was weird. Stuff is kind of secondary to the gaping flaws in terms of character and story. And Monsters vs. Aliens didn't do anything new or different with its genre. Eh, Monsters vs. Aliens was funny though. Like, there were, f I think the president from Monsters vs. Aliens, him just like, he walks up to the alien, he plays music to the giant alien, nothing happens, and then he just pulls out a gun and shoots it. Like, bro, America. That was funny as shit. G two giant buttons, one for coffee, one for nukes. Like, obviously it's cringe, but it's, it's funny cringe. Also, the giantist fetish had to start somewhere. It's just a kid's mo- Eat lead alien! Uh, apparently eats lead. Monster movie that also happens to suck, don't at me. Maybe there was also an issue with the general look of Megamind's characters and world being so similar to this movie. I, know I don't know, I think it's also that there there wasn't like a lot of merchandising game. Like, when it comes to something like Despicable Me, the minions are like uber marketable. Now, as a kid, I was confused by the villain looking visually similar to Megamind, to the point where I mixed up these two movies all the time. Oh, That's the issue with That's Megamind so and the way people perceive Dude, I love this guy. It. On the surface, it it looks pretty similar to a ton of other animated movies at the time, and didn't seem to offer anything new. Many people either didn't give it a chance or watched it but tuned out the really strong elements because they thought it was just a ripoff of other successes. But that couldn't be further from the truth. Real. Megamind is a genre parody, yes, but it does amazing, Real. beautiful, surprising things with the- It does. It's- it's- <laughs> Megamind's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's artistic, and it's so different than- than anything else out there. Like, the fact that Metro... Just the fact that Metro Man wasn't the main villain, and instead the main villain was something that he created, and it was just someone who just got powerful and got corrupted by his power. Like, that's crazy. The genre decides to lovingly spoof. It really has no reason being as great as it is, but as long as it is this great, I'm glad more people are giving it the attention it deserves. It's engaging, clever, fun, and powerful. Kind of like another 2010 DreamWorks movie that went unloved upon its release. I said unloved upon its release. Yeah. That. Oh, well, I mean, Shrek. Yeah, okay. That's the one. Next time, baby. But first, I have Ooh. a quick question. What's, what's stopping the, uh, people from hacking your shit? Yeah, that was a good movie. Uh, it was a great movie. It was a good video, Mr. Shafrilis. 10,000 likes and I'll be watching Shafrilis' fucking, uh, you know, his hour-long video railing the sequel. <laughs> But this was a really good video, and oh God, Megamind is so good.
so 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 good and i'm, I'm i am glad that it's uh more beginning to actually get respected it's 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 actually one of the most goaded superhero parodies i've seen like the way they uh they can parody um i think as as a funny example they parody the uh the incredibly overpowered hero trope in two completely separate ways right like on the one hand you have uh titan who they over he's incredibly powerful and power corrupts and he gets corrupted and then you have metro man he's incredibly powerful and therefore it it edges on nihilism to the point that he just doesn't really care about saving people like they take that overpowered trope and they parody it in two completely opposite directions like how fucking crazy is that and the idea that megamind is is a character that needs to truly find himself and be appreciated for who he is and had to struggle through how society viewed him his whole life that's such a mature take on what creates a villain honestly all in all a subversive masterpiece if you made it to the end click one of these two videos which also will definitely get me canceled see you live on game stay weird fam